Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Seahawk Talk here on the Salve Athletics Network. I am your host, Andy Pizzelli, coming to you live on Facebook, YouTube, and Periscope through Twitter. We have a great show for you lined up here today. We'll be joined by head coach Kevin Gilmartin, CJ Minchin, John Good, Sebastian Nordsey, and Craig O'Rourke the second. Can't wait to get to them. The producers will join me as well to talk about the lead stories and tidbits from today. But first, before we do that, we want to remind you to keep your distance. That's Ed Habershaw giving us his rendition of Keep Your Distance from the Shake, Rhode Island Bass Band. Very appropriate song for these times. Social distancing, hand washing, mask wearing, all that stuff. We've heard all about it. We continue to promote it here on the show. You can see it. It'll be scrolling throughout the show uh, down at the bottom. So we're always going to keep reminding everybody to do those things along with voting. Voting has been the other thing we've been talking about on the program as well. And I know the producers have been talking about that, and they have some other tidbits to lead off today's show. So let's bring them in right now as well. Joey Morelli and Mike DeFusco. Fellas, how are we doing here on Thursday? Doing pretty good, besides the rain, of course. Yeah, aside from the rain, it's pr- pretty good. Definitely didn't sleep through one of my classes today. Nope. Mm-mm. Uh, and <laughs> hypothetically, if I did, I was really sorry about it. <laughs> but it didn't happen so hypothetically yeah. hypothetically, hypothetically. Uh, yeah <laughs> anyway what do you guys have today to uh lead off today's program uh since we're on the topic of voting i'll go ahead and give everyone you know the update and like i was saying in pre-show i don't know how much of this is due to our hard work pushing that message <laughs> here on seahawk talk we can but, take credit uh, yeah, yeah we'll take it some of the credit for, for, for these votes you know there's so a hundred thousand people in rhode island have already voted this was a uh, courtesy of Secretary of State, um, the Rhode Island Secretary of State. And then a quick update here with all the numbers. There are 5,117 already coming in this morning. And here are the total numbers you can see on the screen. Uh, over 218,000 uh, voters in. They've only counted uh, just over 100,000. And then over a quarter of Rhode Island has already turned out to vote. So if you have it, you have to November 2nd. I'll be going in to do mine personally November 3rd. But... Um, for those who haven't, you know, this is um, just a, a little update and, you know, to remind you to get in there and do it before it's too late. Yeah. And a big thing about the early voting, people have been, you know, I did, I've done the early voting for the primary and then for this election, super easy, very convenient, wasn't a long wait. Um, but for people who have mail-in ballots, um, you know, there's some concern about people wanting to know, mailing them in, what if they get there late? You can always just take that mail-in ballot and go and just drop it off at a drop there's drop boxes uh at local election offices you could bring it right to a polling station and hand deliver it uh so if you're at all leery about mailing the ballot um because there are some concerns with it being this late in the game um you can always just go hand deliver that ballot so there is uh there's plenty of ways to make your vote count this year so we want to make sure we remind everybody of all those and those are great numbers i mean 20 percent already is really impressive considering that by and large the numbers say it's unfortunate only about half the people vote, you know, in, in elections. So to have already 27% of people already having voted before election day, I think, uh, I think that speaks to what should be a record turnout, hopefully. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. And I know they were saying now with only a few days to go to try to avoid, um, you can use the Dropbox if you want to, if you really want to stay distant, but they're recommending that you go directly into the balloting now and just drop it right off there with, um, since, you know, they're not sure if they're going to be, um, so with the Dropbox, there might be a day or two delay, and there's only a day or two left. So just make sure you get in there and um, drop it off directly. Awesome. Great stuff. Joey, what do you have for us here at the top? Um, all right. I can talk about uh, Newport Newport food stuff. So yeah. restaurant week. Uh, it happens, you know, every year. Uh, obviously, it's, it's like a whole thing. Um, so, so obviously, restaurants different this year. 
So how is the restaurant week going to work? Well, they've just announced today that they're doing a remix restaurant week. I don't know why they're calling it remix, but it's different. Uh, so from the, when I had it and I've lost the date, the 6th to the 15th, instead of the normal uh, kind of like you go in and you pick like a kind of like curated like X amount of course meal uh, with like a dessert at a fixed price, they're doing uh, all the restaurants that are uh, involved, which is basically all the restaurants in Newport are doing um, special deals instead, which I realized we were talking about, we weren't sure why that in particular they picked. It's because uh, it makes it easier for takeout because if you get a five course meal and it's takeout, that's kind of weird. But if it's, you know, a normal deal, and you take it out, it makes sense, and you still get the great food. So um, a lot of so they listed a lot in this article from uh, Newport Daily News. Um, so uh, Chandler Hotel Cafe is doing a two course dinner with a glass of wine for fifty dollars. Uh, Tame Street Kitchen is doing a three course meal for thirty five dollars. Uh, winner Winner has you get two free sides with the purchase of an eight piece bucket or a rotisserie chicken. Uh, they all have like similar deals like this. It's usually like buy this, get this stuff extra, or it's like get uh, a two course or like two person meal for a really good deal. And um, they're doing uh, obviously a lot of outside dining as well. Most, most if not all these restaurants have outside options uh, if they're not just takeout only. And, and it also lets takeout o- stores that are doing takeout only, you know, participate in a restaurant week this uh this year so um i would definitely say like go uh newport daily news i'm sure every restaurant's website will also have the information on it but uh there's no like complete list of the deals yet but i'd be willing to bet that coming closer probably next week there will be probably on newport daily news uh a big list of all the restaurants participating in all the deals so you can you know look through and find the deals that are perfect for you is it uh, which? What is when is Restaurant Week? That's the question. <laughs> when it's, does it start? Uh, yeah, yeah, the sixth to the fifteenth of November. To the fifteenth. I'm just perusing quickly at uh, our extended forecast because we mentioned the eating outside thing. And at least right now, you know, obviously uh, New England weather can change uh, any hour. It's supposed to snow maybe tomorrow night and then be bright and sunny on Saturday morning. Um, <laughs> But it does look like the weather should be decent for at least the first half of uh, of restaurant week. So if you're thinking about doing the outdoor dining thing, uh, which we've been talking about on here and a lot of restaurants have been pushing, um, you know, as as an option and even the closing off of the streets and being able to have more space outside, it looks like uh, Mother Nature is going to cooperate. In fact, that first day, the 6th, right now they're predicting it to be 65 degrees. So... Uh, perfect nice. way <laughs> to enjoy restaurant yeah. week. Go, 65 go degrees in November. Can't top that. So Yeah, even if it doesn't rain, I mean, the um, as long as it's above, I say, like 30, the heaters that are at some of these restaurants I'm not, are working like very well. I was at City and LBs the other night. I was getting hot. I took my jacket off, actually, at one point during the meal, and it was like 50 out. So as long as it's, as long as it's not raining, I think restaurant week's going to go great. Awesome. So uh, also, I'm noticing in the private chat, Coach Gil Martin uh, already has the information. Uh, if you go to Discover Newport uh, and you go under restaurants, they have Restaurant Week and they have all of the uh, restaurants and deals listed already. So perfect. Go do that. Go find your deal. Yep. Yeah. There we go. All right. Well, you mentioned him. We're going to get to him right now. So we're <laughs> going to go talk to Coach Kevin Gil Martin uh, and uh, and some of his players. So, fellas, great stuff here at the top, and we'll talk to you again at the end. We'll let you guys uh, get behind the scenes and get to work producing the show. All right, see you at the end. All right, that's Joy Morelli and Mike Defusco, the producers here on Seahawk Talk. We're going to get now to head coach Kevin Gilmartin, who's itching to talk food here with us, along with John Good and C.J. Minchin, two defensive backs for Coach Gilmartin's squad. Fellas, how are we all doing? Pretty good to have you. Outstanding. You guys have already started talking about food. You know, now we talk about a lot of football. You know, next thing we'll talk about some family, football, food, family. I mean, what more can we talk about? That's, that's like my perfect wheelhouse. Oh, Kevin, I was also thinking 65 degrees and partly cloudy on a, on a Saturday. I was just in my head. I'm like, oh, it's perfect football weather. <laughs> uh, 
That is, that's the ideal. It's that, that crisp weather, that perfect. You wake up, you feel a little brisk and everything. You get excited. You, I see their two heads shaking right there because they're, they're thinking the exact same thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, all you guys can do now is, is practice. Fall, fall season has been pushed to the, to the spring. Spring football, um, what has practice been like? What phase are you guys in right now? What have you been able to do? I know we talked last time about hopefully being able to get some real one-on-one work going. Uh, what is the update here for you guys? Uh, what we've been doing is we've been doing, uh, you know, we've been getting after one and competing with one another. And so, you know, uh, we've been, uh, in two different practice groups. And so, uh, we've been breaking it up where, you know, it's been, it's been multi years in each group and multi positions in each group so that they're able to compete against one another. So we've been doing, uh, you know, one-on-ones, uh, competing against one another, doing scaly, doing team, getting after a little bit, but, uh, I'll let these guys talk about it, you know, how they've been doing in practice. But, yeah, I mean, of course, everyone wants to be playing games. But I like to think about what I do have and what I don't have. It's nice just to be out there. I tell my guys every day, like, um, I'm just thankful for being here. There's no place I'd rather be, you know what I mean? Like, it, I like the competition. Skelly, we can do team, one-on-ones, like Coach was saying. And, like, that in itself is good enough for me, honestly. I mean, obviously, everyone wants to play games, but it's good enough for now. Yeah, and de- definitely based off what John says, uh, the fact that we get to go out there every day and um, compete. I know many of my friends from back home are at different schools, and uh, they're not allowed to do as much at practice as we are, so I'm very grateful that we get to go do that. And then, you know, just um, meeting the younger guys is a big thing for me. We really didn't get to do it through summer camp, but um, slowly we're able to do it, and we're meeting all the guys, and we're showing everyone what Salve football is like. As defensive backs and, and honestly being, you know, defensive players, um, is it hard or what were the challenges of practicing, uh, maybe even just working over the summer without being able to have that one-on-one aspect, not being able to work against somebody to practice? What were the things you chose to focus on instead that you could work on and maybe how challenging it was before you were able to get back and really get into one-on-one workouts? Well, um, being a defensive back, the most single most important thing is your footwork. And so you might not have somebody going against in front of you every day, but you can still get your footwork better. That's what it's all about. It all starts with the footwork. And, like, obviously lifting weights, getting your hands fast, everything, just being speed, 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 and obviously being in shape. Definitely with the footwork was a big emphasis. Even when we started off in our pods, we were doing just footwork, footwork, footwork. Um, with uh, Coach Jones, he was uh, showing us a few new drills that I've really never seen before. And we're really just um, taking this time to perfect our craft, you know, get good at the little things. So um, we don't have to worry about that stuff uh, as a, if we get a season or when a season comes. Have you really- perfected your craft? No, we're always working. Always <laughs> working. <laughs> always trying to get better. All right. All I was, right. was going to ask, you know, you, you talked about footwork there. Uh, so when it was, you know, things were locked down in the early spring and stuff, so was it just backpedaling everywhere you went? Hey, I got to go get a glass of water. I might as well backpedal into the kitchen, <laughs> that sort of thing. Yeah, pretty yeah. much. Yeah, every, every little thing you can do. Every, it's always football. Like, you know, DJ Flip. definitely agrees with me. We're football oriented. It's on our minds 24 7. And yeah, yeah, everything we do, football. Backpedal to the closet, flip the hips, go to the <laughs> fridge, right? Um, what is the most important attribute? Um, and maybe from a mentality standpoint, what, what's the most important attribute you have to have to be a defensive back? Just I, no fear. No fear. Don't get nervous. Like, especially like, Playing corner, like I was a, I was about, I'm the boundary corner for our team. I have been the past couple of years, so I'm man to man pretty much every single play. And it's like you one wrong step, you're gonna get burned for a touchdown. You know what I mean? So like it's just not getting nervous, laser sharp focus on your opponent, and just all other external factors out of your head. I th- I think the biggest thing to uh, be successful as a defensive back is having short term memory. You know, um, you're going out there and you're competing one on one. As John says, a lot of times you're in a situation where it's just you and another guy and um you know you're gonna mess up sometimes and you're gonna get beat but the biggest thing is just being able to forget about that block that out you know learn from it but go out there the next drive and be able to make a big play and not let that last play uh bog you down for the rest of the game john you you, up go ahead kevin if you wanted to say something no i was trying to piggyback with both what they were saying it's just like because my opinion on the defensive back is very similar to theirs It's, it's that fearless Yes, short-term memory, belief in oneself. One of my favorite stories from a defensive back, and I've probably talked to the probably to these guys once or twice before, is when uh, Deion Sanders was going against Andre Risen. It was like week three 
of the NFL season. Dion was with the 49ers and Andre was with the uh, was with the uh, Falcons. And he had like 28 catches in the first two games of the season. And so it was, it was paired up as Dion versus Andre. It was going. It was a Monday night game too. So it was it was just nothing but hype. Uh, first play of the game, Andre Rising goes for an 80 yard touchdown. Uh, and you know, and then everybody's like, "Oh, it's going to be Andre's day." Rest of the game, nothing, not one catch. And uh, afterwards, the guy interviewing him was like, "Dion, how'd you do that?" I mean, he comes out, gets the 80 yard, and he's like, "You know, sometimes you just got to believe in yourself and get it done." And that's exactly what happened. He get, let up the first one, and then didn't let up another thing. Yeah. Uh, John, I was going to ask you and Kevin, you can correct me because, you know, years and things start to blend. So you can correct me if I'm wrong. This, But, John, I remember uh, I think it was your freshman year. There was an injury. We, the, the team had some injuries in the defensive backfield. You get thrown into a game, uh, you know, in the middle of a drive. And I know from a quarterback's perspective, you see a defensive back go down. Whoever's coming out of the field mm-hmm. first, that quarterback knows who that person is. And you have to probably know the ball's coming my way. They're they're gonna be coming at me because I'm I'm the new guy. Do you remember that moment? And I'm pretty sure. I don't know. Did you get a pick in that drive? I remember you made a at least made a play in the, in the end zone. I can't remember if you had a pass deflection, but it was they tried to go at you multiple times and you kept coming up with the plays. Do you remember that moment? And that kind of speaks to what you said about having no fear. Were were you afraid in that moment or were you just even keeled? You know, I'm ready to make a play. I want the ball to come to me so I can make a play. So yeah, so yeah. When Hayden went down, like I knew first thing I did. Nothing really went through my head. I just strapped my helmet up and ran on the field. And, yeah, like that game, obviously they're going to target the corner. But it wasn't even just that one game. It was the whole season. The whole yeah. team, every single team knows this kid. You know, like I'm small. I'm not the biggest kid. And, like, so I was I was just actually a sophomore. And they know we're going to we're gonna pick yeah. on this kid. You know what I mean? Like we're, we're going to pick on this kid day in and day out. And, like, that's I would have, like, five pass breakups a game. Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> and, like, obviously I give, up, I give up plays, but – it's like like CJ said, short term memory loss just roll with the punches. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think from the other team's perspective is you know they they have a you know Hayden Hayden was an all conference uh, defensive back and they bring in uh, another guy who's five foot negative two and they said we're gonna have to go after this guy you know and uh, you know but but height doesn't matter it's heart that's more important and he backed it up every time and yeah so I know exactly what you're talking about Andrew with the uh, with that first series and it was he batted one away in the back corner of the end zone and uh, and said yeah keep coming my way <laughs> um, yeah, I want to ask you guys too, so made everything better <laughs> I want to ask you guys something uh, I'm not sure if you saw you brought up the Atlanta Falcons I'm not sure if you guys saw the end of their game uh, this past weekend. Uh, a little bit of situational football. They had a chance to just run the clock out, and uh, Todd Gurley breaks the line of scrimmage. That's first and goal, and he like realized he was going to score. He shouldn't score. He falls, and Atlanta scores a touchdown. You'd think good. It's a rare time you see the d- the defense being like, "No, he's in. He's in. We want him to be in," because it gave the Lions uh, a chance to to get the ball back. Uh, and obviously the Lions go right down the field with no timeouts and miraculously score a touchdown. Uh, a lot of blame on the defense for the Falcons, but it kind of goes back to that moment of just kneel on the ball and kick the field goal, make them waste time. Um, do you guys practice those types of situations or is that just a discussion thing, whether it's the, Hey, this is when we don't want to score. This is when we want to take intentional safeties, all those kind of odd moments uh, in a game. Do you practice those or Kevin, is that something that the coaches, you don't want to make the players think too much about these things. Let the coaches kind of run through those things themselves. Uh, a little bit of both. I mean, you want them to have great, you, you know, they, you want them to have the high football IQ. And so you're constantly uh, trying to educate them and teach them. So you do it in practice, you do it in the meetings, you show it in the film room and everything. And, uh, you know, for some guys, you can you can keep adding, you know, the football IQ into it because you know that they'll be able to absorb it and be able to, to think about it on the, the field. But meanwhile, there's some other guys that you're just like, let's just let's not let him think. We'll have some other guys thinking for him. We'll, we'll help him out with that one. You know, and, uh, I think you guys would agree with that, right? Yeah, yeah most definitely. <laughs> um, are there any examples uh, from either college or high school of, of plays or situations like that that you've either seen or been a part of? Oh, I, I vividly remember um, I'm, I'm a Giants fan. So back in the Super Bowl, the whole – I think it was Bradshaw who was carrying it in. And uh, he kind of like froze. On Gerard the Mayo line. threw him into the yeah. end zone. <laughs> yeah, and he, he like didn't know what to do. And I, I saw that for some reason. And I, I kind of had a flashback to that, but um, it's ju- it's just funny. And you know, you you think of awareness football and like guys who have that little extra IQ it could really help them, but not only them, but benefit the team. So 
it's little mm-hmm. things like that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And it doesn't mean like how, no matter how much experience you have, I saw like two weeks ago, Tom Brady didn't even know it was fourth down. Yeah. Like <laughs> on fourth down. So yeah, it's all about situational awareness. So you, you got to have it. Well, that's because Tom's a senior citizen now. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> but that's why you, you practice those moments and you do it so that, you know, it almost becomes so natural for him during those times. Uh, one, one that I would sh- share was when I, I was a head coach at a high school and uh, it was my first year there. And uh, the other team just got a first down and there was about minute 50 to go. We didn't have any timeouts left and it was inside the five yard line. So I thought they were going to take a knee. So they ran the ball and we stopped them. And then for the next play, I said, score, you know, cause we were, we were down two at the time. So they scored, they made it nine. And then we got the ball back, throw down the field, scored got the onside kick, drove down the field, went to kick the field goal. It was a, it was a 27 yarder, went to kick the field goal and missed. Uh-huh. <laughs> so it would have been perfect, but didn't get, we didn't get it done. Mm-hmm. Cool. Great stories guys. Mm-hmm. Uh, thank you so much for coming on and joining me here today. Great stuff. Good luck with the rest of the fall and hopefully see you guys out on the field this spring. Yep. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Always. Thank you for having us. Take it easy. That's head coach Kevin Gilmartin joined by CJ Minchin and John Good from our football team. We're going to go now to the head coach of our women's volleyball team, Sebastian Nordzi. Sebas, how are we doing? I'm doing great. It's a great day to be an indoor sport. <laughs> I, was gonna, I was just thinking the same thing. You know, at least the last couple of days, rain, 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 snow, maybe tomorrow. Uh, it is good that none of that impacts your sport, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I used to play soccer. And back then it used to be rainy all the time. You'd play through it, of course. And then once I found volleyball, I was like, wait, we don't ever cancel games because of rain and we don't have to worry about snow. Yeah. Sign me up. (laughs) Yeah. Now, one of the weird things, though, is, you know, the weather can still affect your sport in in a little way. And that's depending on like humidity. You know, you might get a court that's slick and slippery, depending if it's a hardwood court or composite surface. Um does any uh, do you have any memories or thoughts of has that ever been a factor for you either in your playing or coaching career when you've been oh man we don't want to go to that gym it's always super muggy there and it's going to be slick and how do you handle those such it's not like you can throw on like long cleats like they do no. in outdoor <laughs> sports yeah so that happens often um, you have some facilities out there which are volleyball specific and it's so hard to maintain humidity control in those places so if it is a rainy day similar today. Um, you get slick surfaces and it's so hard to just work with that. And last year when I was at Johnson and Wales, we also had an issue with some slick floors. Part of it was humidity. Part of it was like a cleaning solution that they used. And it's so tough for volleyball athletes because there's so much cutting involved that if you just slip on the wrong spot, you're, you know, bad yeah. things can happen. So we always try to take as much precaution as possible, you know, having towels on hand, um, those mop things that people use in basketball games, um, whatever we can do to keep the floors as, you know, has some friction and not like an ice rink. Yeah. Um, so let's get the update from practice. Uh, how far have you guys uh, ramped up to and how has practice been going? Yeah, practices have been great. We actually had a little scrimmage yesterday, um, 6v6, and it was great to get the girls playing against each other in an actual like game-type format with the ref and whistles um, and scoreboard and everything. But unfortunately, we'll be ending our fall on Halloween with just like a fun little Halloween practice. So we had awesome weeks. Like I'm so glad we got to experience being in the gym together, even during this crazy time. Um, and unfortunately it's going to have to come to an end pretty soon. Yeah. How much of a benefit do you think mentally it is for the team, for, for, for the girls as athletes to, to have gotten to practice and to have at least gotten that little scrimmage and some simulated game action in. Yeah, I thought it was huge. I actually saw one of them, um, at a coffee place I went to this morning, she was working and she was like, Oh coach, like the scrimmage was so much fun yesterday. I loved it. It was like so excited about it. And I think just mentally, it just brings you to just another level. Like, especially with these college athletes, they're studying, they just had, you know, seasons ripped away from them. So to have a little something that they can look forward to or look back upon 
is just so huge for like their mental makeup. And even for like me, I love coming to the gym every day because it's a nice little break on whatever happening with the world. Um, everything's going crazy. Things are not what they have normally been. But I know once I'm in that gym for an hour and a half, nothing really matters except for a past set hit. Yeah. You kind of started to answer my next question, which was going to be, how has it benefited you uh, getting to do those things? And also, how do you feel you've grown as a coach from the spring when you're hired? Yay, I'm going to be a head coach. I've got to college my own team. And then, you know, we're shut down for forever. And now you're back with all these restrictions. It's kind of been trial by fire. Uh, how do you feel you are now? Yeah, no, it's been awesome um, with that perspective, too, because there's that old Lord of the Rings saying, like, it, out of the frying pan into the fire. And that's kind of how I felt this whole entire time. It's like, all right, I'm in the fire now. Let's figure it out. Um, and it's been it's been creative. I had to be creative at times with certain regulations. Um, I've been panicked at times. I've been like, oh, my God, this is crazy. But at the same time, I just buckled up my bootstraps and uh, got to it. Now, you talked about how practice will ramp down and unfortunately uh, come to a close on Halloween. Uh, and then, obviously, hopeful for games in the spring. That's a long break. How do you prepare and plan um, for such a long break uh, with, with the team? So I believe it's a lot of to do with the culture that's in place. I believe that the athletes are intrinsically motivated to do what they need to do in the offseason. Then they'll come into our season better prepared. Like if they're motivated themselves to get into the weight room, to find reps volleyball wise, to do X, Y, Z, then it's just a lot easier for me because I can't really be there to hold their hand throughout the whole entire process. But if we have great leadership and we have people invested and that buy-in, now they're on their own doing what they need to do to get better and prepare for what we want to do in the springtime. Yeah. Uh, now, this will be a final practice on Halloween. I will assume there's going to be costumes involved. Oh, yeah. uh, have you picked out a costume for yourself? I have. I've used the same costume for a year, I believe now. Um, it was a $5 special at Savers, uh, and it's a pretty good one. <laughs> um, I was going to say, make sure pictures, pictures, pictures. If either myself or Ed can't be there, take a million pictures. We want to be able to bring those on Seahawk Talk next week. Uh, my last question for you, Halloween theme. We've been asking a lot of people this question. Uh, you've got your Halloween, you got your candy bag. You open it up. What is the top five candies? that Sebastian Norsey wants to find in his Halloween bag? Um, Skittles, peanut M&Ms, Snickers, Twix, and Heath Bar. Whew. Let's All right, so if, if the producers want to bring me back, uh, I think, let's see here, because I got, I went to BJ's, so I got the big old, the big old bag. So we've got, uh, we've got some peanut M&Ms. Yes. Uh, we've got Twix. Oh, yes. Uh, we've got, what else did you say? Snickers, yep. Snickers, uh, Reese's are in the other uh, assorted bag, but I do have them, and we've got uh, we've got the Heath bar. So oh my God, you can go. I'll be going was, to BJ soon. <laughs> this was like seven bucks for net weight three pounds of candy. <laughs> oh my God! So how much can I get with thirty dollars? <laughs> quite a lot. Uh, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna try to do math on air, uh, but 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 quite a lot. So uh, yeah. I want to see the pictures of the practice. That's going to be that's going to be awesome. Absolutely. So. We'll take a lot of pictures for you. All right. Awesome. Seabass, great to see you. Good luck with your final practices this week, and we can't wait to talk to you again next week. Awesome. Thanks, Pez. Thanks for having me. All right. That's Sebastian Nordzi, the head coach of our women's volleyball team. Well, while I take a break out of this Kit Kat bar, we're going to go to break and be back with Craig O'Rourke the second. Don't go anywhere. So you want to be a Seahawk? Let's make sure you wash your hands, keep your distance, wear your mask, and love your Seahawks. Sammy, no mask? 
Come on, Sammy. I know it's pumpkin spice season, but you can't bring drinks to class. We have simple rules here, Sammy. Get out. Come back when you can follow them. You gotta take care of yourself and others, even if you are Sammy the Seahawk. I'm still chewing on the Kit Kat bar. Welcome back to Seahawk Talk. I'm your host, Andrew Pizzelli, joined now by Craig O'Rourke II, head coach of our men's soccer team. Craig, how are we? Good. I didn't think I was going to be on. I was searching for a link as to how to actually join the broadcast. And until I just got your email 10 seconds ago, I didn't have any way to get in here. I read your mind. Uh, I want to ask you first, we got to set the record straight uh, on the program. We, we set the record straight with Matt Hurd uh, the other day, whether or not he had a cell phone. We like to fact check ourselves. We like to correct mistakes or any erroneous statements that were made. Um, I'm going to let you set the record straight. Something that was said by one of your players a couple of weeks ago uh, about you wanting to be a British coach. Um, is, is that true? Do you desperately wish to be like a British coach? Uh, that is not true, and uh, Immigration and Naturalization Services are looking into James Davies' uh, student visa as to whether or not he can remain in the country, uh, having received an anonymous tip that he may, in fact, uh, uh, be a non-naturalized citizen. So we'll see if Davies is back on roster next year after his um, – somewhat infamous and erroneous comment that I have some desire to be a British soccer coach. As I told James at the last few sessions, I prefer to have my teams advance beyond the semifinal round since the English national team has not done that in their last, I don't know, 30, 40 major international tournaments. I don't think I'm a British coach at all. I think I'm a tried and true American coach that has developed football to a very high level in this country and will continue to see the American team succeed where the English team fails. Uh, I know you like um, discussing the history of the sport and the history of your teams. You've had four teams that come to mind that stand out during your time at Salve. 2010 team, 14, 6, and 2. 2012, 16, 6, and 1. 2018, 16, 1, and 3. And last year, 14, 4, and 4. Imagine some scenario like fantasy. Like you can put all those teams as they were uh, on the pitch against each other in a round robin. Who wins? A round robin. Ooh. Who wins and why? Not bracket style because you might not get all the matchups. Yeah. They all get to play each other. Because I, I was going to say, if it's bracket style, it totally depends upon round robin. But if it uh, it totally depends upon the matchup. So if you go round robin and they all play each other, wow, um, that's interesting. Because ten and twelve shared players, eighteen and nineteen shared players, and uh, when you do that, you have to look at like the twenty ten Robert Ernst versus the twenty twelve Robert Ernst, and. The 2018 Evan McDonald, the 2018 Casey Kelly versus the 20, 2019 versions of them, of themselves. Um, geez, round robin, holy cow! So ten's playing all three. Um, it, it's fascinating. Ten was a, an extremely good, extremely high collection of talent. Ten um, scored 50 goals. Ten set the school record for goal differential. Um, in some ways, I call 10 my greatest failure as they played back in the version of the Commonwealth Coast Conference. that had 14 teams in it. And with two games left in the conference schedule, 2010 was sitting in first place. And all they needed was three points from their last two games. And they would have locked up the number one seed and had the conference tournament come through Newport. And had they done that, 2010 would have won the the conference title. Uh, 2010 was the most talented team in the conference that year. Um, they led the conference with all conference selections. Um, they might have been my most athletic team as they had like six footers and, and God, they must have had five or six guys with 
uh, four digit epic scores. They they were they were strong, quick, and powerful. 20, 2010 was a sight to behold. Twenty God, twenty ten was good. Um, but as good of as twenty ten was, twenty twelve was a better team. Twenty ten had more talent, more athleticism on paper. You, you'd take twenty ten nine out of ten times, but but twenty twelve was a better team, and twenty twelve won the title because they were a better team. It's interesting because matchup wise, I I think twenty twelve who had sixteen wins, a sixteen six and one team might go zero and three, and I hate saying that. Because it's it's a proverbial paper matchup. You can't actually see them on the field. Yeah. Um, but I, I just don't see how 12, because 12 was powered by two seniors, Gando and Ernst, both of whom hung all New England plaques, both of whom were nothing short of outstanding for me. Um, they they literally are in, in in the captain's roster bold italicized. And the reason they're bold italicized is because they are the standard against which all team captains are compared. Um, and they had virtually a non-existent junior class. There was one junior on roster who became academically ineligible due to a problem with the registrars. So that their supporting class was, um, or supporting cast was, was sophomores and freshmen. And that freshman class was something special with Chenard and Rayner and Stern and Joe and Mark and whatnot. But um, I, I think 12 would go 0 and 3. So then, how does 10 match up with 18 and 19? 10 versus 19 would be interesting because 19 was good. 19 was a very, very good team. But 10's athleticism makes it almost a mismatch. A mismatch. And you'd have to put Casey Kelly um, trying to stop Robert Ernst on all set pieces. And Casey Kelly is a phenomenal athlete. But Robert Ernst was a freak of nature. Robert Ernst, there, there's film of corner kicks and set pieces being played into the box and the opponent's keeper coming out and with an outstretched hand trying to punch the ball, big Bobby Ernst's head is above the huh. keeper's outstretched fist and heading the ball down. And it, that, I mean, that alone just gives this entire uh, element to 2010's aerial superiority. And then, oh, yeah, you can throw McAllister and Jen Chin and KJ and Carol and holy shit. 10 is, 10 is just a problem for everybody just from the physical dimensions of what 10 had. Um, 10, I, I think 10 might even beat 19. And then it comes down to, you know, 10 versus 18. 18 versus 19 is, is almost uh, a no-brainer because uh, the 19 starting 11 essentially was mostly the B side for 18. Um, I, I think 18, because of the number of weapons it had in the field and the way it attacked in a front seven um, and playing in a 3-4-1-2 matching up against 10 and 12, which are both 4-5-1s, even a back four, um, thinking it might be more defensively solid against 18 and 19. I just don't. I think I think 18 would go 3-0. and I think the second place would come down to that 2010 versus 2019 game. And I think if 10 plays set pieces and throws Ian and Bobby forward, um, they're going to get the goal. And then it comes down to whether or not they can make the goal stand up against 19. And that's that's Emac. That's Alessandro. That's that's Guerra. That's Hilby. That's Dana. That's you know Ventura in the box to box. That's that's a coin toss. Ten versus sounds 15. like it'd be a lot of really exciting soccer. Oh, you know? it'd be great! It'd be great because 10, 10 wasn't as possession based as eighteen and nineteen. Ten just wanted to go. Ten wanted to get up the field and create its chances. And and if you couldn't hang with ten athletically you were overmatched and 10 could run through you. Um, and if they didn't run through you, KJ would knock you over because he was just a bowling ball on the field. Um, 19 wants to keep the ball. 19 would go east to west on 10 and try to stretch him out. But 10 had a very good back four. James Dean, possibly the best left back the program has ever seen. Um, that's a coin toss. And I, and I hate to admit it, but if Gando and Bobby are seeing this or ever watch this, um, 
I'm going to get crucified for it, but I'm going to say 12 would be 0-3 in the matchups. Um, simply, if for no other reason, they had a big, fat center back in shoe, and they the teams would find a way to get around him. But. It would depend on the type of game that unfolds, too. Like, if 19 can keep the ball away from 10, then yeah. 19 can probably win. But yeah. all it would take is two, right. two, two breakdowns and 10 puts up two quick goals. Now 19's in trouble. Yeah, and, and 19 did uh, – no, 18 did that. 18, 18 came from behind, 2 nothing at Wentworth. Um, did 19 ever play from behind and win? 19 was behind against Dartmouth and Boston, both one nothing results. 19 was behind against Dodger and came back to tie 1-1. When else was 19 trailed at Eastern Naz and never fully recovered? God, that's it's still what you on. trailed in the championship game. I don't think it wasn't two nothing. Oh, yeah, no, we tra- you're right. We trailed against Endicott one nil and then trailed again against two one. I'm, I'm not I, just just off the top of my head. I don't think you overcame any two nil deficit. There were you weren't trailing all that often either. No, so. no, nine, 19 very rarely trailed. 18 trailed two nothing at Wentworth. Came back to make it two two. Then trailed 3-2, immediately it made it 3-3, and then won 4-3 in double overtime on what might have been Evan McDonald's best goal of his career. Um, and then they trailed 2-0 and then eventually 3-0 in the semifinal home against Gordon and made it 3-2 before finally succumbing to a 4-2 scoreline. Um, there was a uh, 20, 2010 trail 2-0 at Gaudet to a Curry team, and they trailed 2 nothing late. Oh, my God. There was only – there was less than 20 minutes left on the clock when we went down 2-0, and they wound up winning it 3-2 in, double, in either overtime or double overtime. Um, and that that was that was a galvanizing moment for that team. And I, I – similar to what the Wentworth game was um, for 2018 – when, when both those games unfolded, I, I sincerely questioned whether or not there was going to be anything on our schedule that could stop us in both those years. And inevitably, both those teams uh, bowed out in conference semifinals, 10 um, tying and then succumbing in a shootout and 19 being upended by the eventual champion Gordon. Excuse me, 18 being upended by the eventual champion Gordon. Um, but though those four teams, you know, those four teams have been my four best at Salve, um, three of them winning championships, 12, 18, and 19, 12, a conference tournament title going to the NCAs, 18, the conference regular season, and 19, the first team in school history, not just under me, but under any Salve coach, um, to sweep, winning both the regular season and the conference tournament. None of the previous Salve teams that had gone to the NCAs or, or won conference titles had ever swept both regular season and tournament championships. So, I mean, and that alone, in terms of hardware earned, 19 would earn the bragging rights. But in, in, a, in a round robin, it's interesting not doing the bracket because the bracket would totally depend upon the matchups. But making it a round robin in true soccer fashion and having everybody play in group format, um, I do think 18, which, which I've always maintained as my best team, um, 18, God, that team can just do things on, on across all three thirds of the field going forward. Now, here's kind of the same same question, but a little bit different. Are there any other Salve teams which maybe didn't have the pedigree, the success of those four, but strictly off of a matchup would have posed a threat to any of those those four? It's, it's interesting because I always talk about it. Um, the 2009 team, 2009, is like the Salve team that no one talks about, but they still have the school record for fewest goals in a season, uh, minimum 14 games. They only allowed 17 goals. And uh, Sean McAllister, who is an illustrious alum, um, is quick to point out that he played half the season at center back and then half the season in an attacking fashion coming off of his uh, a true winger. Um, he led the team in scoring, only playing half the season in the front three. Um, and during his time at center back, uh, we didn't give up many goals, and quite frankly, all seven losses were by a single goal, usually one nothing score lines. Um, so that team finishing eleven seven and one on this season, but setting that school record of fewest goals allowed is is a team that just quickly jumps to mind. Um, and because of their that they were a four five one, um, 
mostly with KJ running up top and two holding mids in front of a, a secure back four, although that was, I hate to admit it, an American diamond with a sweeper stopper. Um, that team... That why team do, why do you hate to admit it? I thought, we were, I thought we were championing the American coaching style. Why do you hate to admit it? Well, no, the, the sweeper stopper is, is, is an American back four system that um, I think has lost a lot of uh, luster and, and notoriety. It, it's just been exposed because it allows for pockets of space in front of the back four and in between the two center backs when they're staggered like that. It was a, a famous quote by a former Western New England, now Williams College coach Aaron Sullivan, that he used to challenge his strikers and forwards to be offside when Salve was in that back four with Ian Gentian as our sweeper back because he always said that Ian would just drop all the way to his goal line and into his net if he could. So there was no chance of Western New England strikers being offside. Um, no, I, I, we don't play with a, a, a sweeper stopper simply because the sweeper being so deep more or less duplicates in possession what the goalkeeper can do with his feet. Um, and now, you know, us playing with three center backs in our modern system and how dependent upon we are on those center backs in our possession to give us the east west play and have us pivot our uh, positioning and attack off of them. Um, yeah, that the, the diamond, the diamond back four sweeper stopper has just become antiquated, and I, I don't think you'll see it much in in the college game moving forward. But that was termed the American system because that's what was pioneered by um, probably American high school coaches. And uh, as as the hallmark of soccer is, as soon as you think you figure the game out, the game evolves and changes. And uh, we have definitely seen that over my tenure here at Salve and. And in the Commonwealth Coast Conference, teams have developed and evolved. Systems of play have developed and evolved. God, I haven't played the same system in three consecutive seasons, I think. During my 14 years, it's always changing and evolving. And even this year, the 2020 team, we're potentially evolving and changing our system of play yet again as we move away from tandem striker and uh, potentially look to go to a box in the midfield and play two attacking center mids. I want to ask you something that uh, has nothing to do with soccer at all. Um, what are your plans uh, for Halloween uh, with your family? You guys, is there going to be any sort of trick-or-treating, mm. home-style trick-or-treating? We'll trick-or-treat throughout the backyard. Uh, what's the plans with, with the family for Halloween? It's interesting because Halloween is probably the holiday that my son despises the most. He has really? no interest in Halloween whatsoever. He openly professes that he does not like Halloween. Um, the only thing he likes about Halloween is uh, he gets to hand out the candy. He has no interest in dressing up, no interest in going out. He doesn't like going door to door. Uh, my son does not have a sweet tooth, so frankly, candy doesn't interest him. He has a, a, a huge salt fetish. He likes uh, salty snacks. He'd rather have pretzels and chips than anything sweet. Um, but frankly, with COVID right now, um, our neighborhood uh, in Rumford is renowned for having this uh, – uh, annual Halloween parade every year. And they made the announcement about two weeks ago that the Halloween parade would be canceled this year, mm -hmm. that they weren't going to do it because of the COVID restrictions. Um, so our street actually is planning not to celebrate. Um, we're probably going to turn the lights off and, and not do anything uh, for Halloween and just, you know, have the sign out front that says uh, no candy at this house. And um, well, it's not. I, I, all right. So this is, this is the next question. You said he doesn't have the sweet tooth. I know you do. So I have a huge sweet tooth. So so you know to say that there's no candy at this house that might be a lie. Uh, no the, candy for distribution would probably yeah, be a more I, accurate. Yeah, I think that would be more accurate. I can always already safely assure you, candy has been purchased. Um, it is in the house. It will be consumed at this house. So I want I want to get your thoughts. Uh, I I you went got. to I went to BJ's and I got three of these variety bags. They okay, what's like, in the variety bag? So this one, we'll get there. We'll get there. Uh, this 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 one has, uh, I think it's like, there's nine different candies in here, and we bought three different bags. Um, but I wanted to ask you first, uh, before I get to what I have assorted here in front of me, uh, Craig O'Rourke uh, is is walking around. It's he's he's 12 years old. He's trick or treating, or maybe maybe Craig O'Rourke the second now is. Is trick or treating? I, was and, say, I don't know what my father was doing when he was twelve. Years old, but. <laughs> uh, opens up his Halloween bag and and looks what? inside. I can't talk right now. <laughs> yeah, I'm serious, please. Looks inside and 
What are the top five candies that Krugel Work the Second wants to find inside his candy bag on Halloween? All right, so you're not talking about what the neighborhood has distributed to me. You're no, asking you, me what you're, you're, you look in there, you want these five, you, you know, you you see these five things in there and you're like, yes, this is exactly what I wanted. Okay. hundred gram without a doubt. Um, one of the, one of the lesser known, but quite frankly, one of the most marvelous candies ever conceived. Um, the hundred gram bar Twix, uh, the left Twix, the right Twix. I don't care which Twix love the Twix. Um, You know, I, I have a soft spot in my heart for Kit Kat, but I, I don't I I'm debating whether or not I want Kit Kat in there. Definitely hundred grand, definitely Twix. Um, I think Mounds and Almond Joys are absolute um, horrific concoctions. I have no desire. I can safely say that neither of them would make my top five. Um Oh, you're against the Almond Joy. Yeah, I don't care for Almond Joy. I don't really care for Almond Joy. Almond Joy is Mounds's brother. It's in, it's in my top five, five, Craig. I knew, I knew, I, I said, there's one I'm person I know. Back. And if you don't like coconut, Mounds and Almond Joy are superfluous. Um, Kit Kat, you know, I, I love Twizzlers. Absolutely love Twizzlers. The problem is a fun size Twizzler just doesn't give you enough. It's it's like it just is like it's tantalizing. It's tempting, but Twizzlers you need like the big full size package, even a jumbo package to really enjoy Twizzlers. Um, uh, payday. Uh, if you want nuts, I really enjoy Payday. Um, I'm trying to think, and I, I you know in the battle between Snickers and Milky Way, I prefer Milky Way. Milky Way is the Three Musketeer bar with caramel. Oh, Three Musketeers! I hadn't. There's one I hadn't. I'd like completely forgotten about. Yeah, what about Butterfingers? Good. Butterfingers are in my top five. I love Butterfinger. Butterfinger is a great one. I probably should have included that as my number Reese's five. Reese's cups. I don't care for peanut butter. Ah, chocolate okay. and peanut butter, I can live or take. M and M's. M and M's is just chocolate. That's just straight chocolate. If you if you want that, do the Hershey bar. Um, Got that I, too. Yeah, I'd, if you're going to do a Hershey bar, make it a crackle so you got the crisp rice in it. Heath bar? Oh, that's a good one. A toffee. I didn't think about toffee. Heath bar. Great. I love it. Put that over the Butterfinger. <laughs> uh, I'm also thinking about how all of these could be used uh, to go on top of ice cream as well. You know, yeah. That, that, What's that the comes one? There's a new one. I want to say it's take five. What's that, take five? Is that the one with pretzels in it? No, take take five is oh no, fast break. Reese's fast break is their their bar. Take five. I just got too much. I just got too much candy going going through my head. Let's see. We can we can pull. We can effort this. We can we can effort this. Take five. Yeah, take five. Oh, oh yeah, Reese's take five. Take yeah, five is a candy bar released by the Hershey Company in December two thousand four. The original name of the candy bar was Take Five, but common usage among consumers added a space between the word take and the numeral five. In June 2019, when the candy bar became part of the Reese's family, the name officially was changed to Reese's Take Five. Okay, great. Now, can you tell me what's in it? Uh, you got the Reese's peanut butter. You've got a pretzel. It looks like there's a little caramel as well. Peanut butter and pretzels. Yeah, take five. Top five, take five. Yeah, 100 Take, grand fi still take five <laughs> takes the fifth spot. No, 100 grand sits at number one. I was trying to think of what this is. It's interesting that it was developed by Hershey and then Reese's bought it. I would put this in number two. This is like what peanut butter cups should be but aren't. Um, 100 grand one, take five, two. Twix, hand be to God, number three. I'm going to go and say Kit Kat can occupy the number four spot because I still have the loyalty to Kit Kat. Best thing about Kit Kat is that there is four bars all connected. And then I, I would put Heath Bar in at number five. The heck with Butterfinger. Heath Bar in at five for me. There we go. All right. Well, Craig, now that I've got you probably salivating, I will let you go so you can go eat all the candy in your house. Uh, good luck with uh, the remainder of your, your fall season. Uh, a, a enjoyable Halloween night at home. And uh, we'll talk to you next week. I would put Baby Ruth at number six over oh, Butterfinger. There's, a, there's another good one. See, this is – I know you like these things, the list things. Yes. So we, we'll, we'll, I'm, I'm trying to come up with ones that I know will uh, – that you'll be you'll be interested in. And I know if there's one thing I can get you passionate about, it's Salve Soccer and it's food. 
So. Yeah, food definitely. So, all right, next week we will continue it. All right, take it easy now. That is Craig O'Rourke, the second, the head coach of our men's soccer team. We're going to go right to the producers now, Joy Morelli and Mike DeFusco, to close out today's program. Fellas, uh, your thoughts on our guests here today? Craig O'Rourke. Do I have to say anything else? Just Craig O'Rourke the second. That's all we need for an hour <laughs> slot. <clears throat> <laughs> Excuse me. Let's just get him in here for one hour next time. <laughs> Maybe when we have when we have days off, you know, planned days off, we can just give Craig the link and say, "Hey, Craig, if you want to come on, we'll give you the soapbox." Um, you know, he yeah, can we'll, fill in for us. It'll be a Seahawks special every Saturday or Sunday. It'll be like some people's <laughs> church. We'll do it every Sunday. Every Sunday. <laughs> oh no! Don't. I don't know. He, I think he may have just left, but we don't. We we can't let Craig. The Church of Craig. I think that that that. <laughs> We'll, we'll we'll write that one down. We'll, we'll become we'll, a demagogue after that one. We'll we'll <laughs> run that by him uh him, him next week. Yeah. Oh man. Uh oh he saw it. He just said heck yes in the in, in the comment section. <laughs> oh um, no. <laughs> so anyways, uh aside from Greg, uh yeah. any other thoughts from our guests uh here today from uh from you, Mike or Joey? Uh hearing uh football talk about like how to practice his defense. Like I hadn't thought of that. Like it's like really hard to do defense by yourself. Like there's no if there's no one to practice with, then like yeah, you have to. What was it you were saying? Uh, do the I can't think of the word to like get back, back 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 pedal into the kitchen, backpedal. flip the hips, go to the fridge. The you know, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah back pedal to the. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, that's yeah. that. Yeah, I hadn't even thought of that. Like defense players, like that's that's the worst to practice. Definitely, I would think. Oh my god, I didn't even consider yeah. that. And also the verbal part of uh, defense with the chirping mm-hmm. you get with the receivers. And I, I know, I know, Johnny. He was he's good at that. He was doing that when I was filming their practice on um uh, last week. He was getting he was talking to the receivers. So that's a big part that you cannot practice uh, by yourself. You can't make fun of yourself too much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, all right. Uh, before we go, I wanted to share this story um, from the Newport Daily News. Uh, this was uh, Portsmouth Girls okay. Soccer. Um, Good. I going to bring this up if you didn't. <laughs> yeah, they uh, they had their senior night uh, last night. Uh, and I, I like the title, uh, Beats Coventry, The Rain, and Further COVID Restrictions. Uh, <laughs> so they win 3-1 on their senior night. Usually, you know, you have your senior night, probably like one of the last home games uh, of the season. Uh, they opted to have it somewhere here in the middle, obviously because you know they weren't sure will the full season be played, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, it's just a really good article. Uh, Steve Rogers did this uh, for the Newport Daily News, um, but it's just striking. You know, we're here. We're seeing games being played, players in masks. Uh, you know, on on both sides. Um, but the the players talked about uh, wanting. You know, uh, obviously. They weren't even sure if they'd have a season. And then the emotions of getting to have their season and then a senior night, you know, uh, one of them talked about, you know, it, it wasn't until it was over they realized, like, oh, my God, like, we're actually seniors and they're crying. and uh, But so grateful that they were able to have anything. Uh, and I think that's, you know, we've heard a lot of that from our coaches and our players here at Salve. It's just how grateful to have practice, um, you know, something you never probably would have thought about, uh, you know, uh, under normal circumstances, how grateful you are to have practice. Um, but just a really, a really, a feel good story, uh, amidst what, uh, is generally, is a lot of not so good news, um, but a great story for, uh, for Portsmouth girls soccer. Definitely. Just gotta be grateful with what you have. Like they said, pretty much that's, that's really it. Yeah. Cool. Well, Fellas, that's going to do it for today. Uh, I'm just going to remind everybody like we've been doing about voting. Mike, you had the great stats at the beginning of the show. 27% of the state has already voted. That is fantastic. Continue to keep it up. Get out and vote early if you can. If you have an absentee, you know, a mail-in ballot, um, you certainly could mail it. But if you don't feel comfortable with that, they're encouraging people now uh, just to go bring it. Bring it right to a polling station, right to a polling place, hand deliver it. Um, so that you can make sure your vote counts. Uh, you know, you know, everybody jokes, you know, this year is the most important election. This is a very important election. We're, we're, and, and we're seeing that from the number of people who have already turned out to vote. Um, so we're going to continue to, uh, to encourage the voting, uh, and, uh, only a couple of days left before the election. We won't be on, on that Tuesday. So, uh, only two more episodes left for us before the election. So as often as we can, we want to encourage people to go vote. Definitely everybody go do it. I'm going home to do it. If you got to send your messengers to the mail, do that as well. Cool. 
All right, fellas, great work here today, and uh, we'll talk to you tomorrow on a Friday, and it may be a costume Friday for us here on Seahawk Talk. Let's see. <laughs> All right, take it easy now, fellas. That is Joey Morelli and Mike DeFusco, the producers here on Seahawk Talk. A big thanks to our guests here today. We had Kevin Gilmartin, CJ Minchin, John Good, Sebastian Nordsey, and Craig O'Rourke the second there at the end. We can't wait to get to tomorrow's show to round out the week. Once again, we're live every day, 3 to 4 p.m. here on the Salve Athletics Athletics Network. That is Facebook, YouTube, and Periscope through Twitter. You can like, follow, and subscribe on all those platforms to never miss a show. And you can also subscribe to the Seahawk Talk podcast through Sounder FM or your favorite podcasting platform so you can take Seahawk Talk on the go. That'll do it for us here today, everyone. Thank you for joining in. Thanks to our guests once again. I am Andrew Pazelli. Have a good afternoon, everyone.